Chapter 6 of the story, we're now in the chapter called The Wanderings. Last week, God led the children of Israel to Mount Sinai. The covenant was formed, the law was given, the worship was established, the tabernacle was built, everything was prepared. God had this covenant people. And now he was leading them north to the land of Canaan, where they would enter in and take the land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You remember how Abraham was moved from the Ur of Chaldees to the land of Canaan, uh, Genesis chapter 12. And there, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the sons of Jacob. And then they had that great famine uh, in the land. And Jacob, Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt, became the governor. Jacob and his family moved to Egypt because there was food for 430 years. The family of Jacob lived in the land of Goshen in Egypt. Last week, we heard about deliverance, or two weeks ago, God leading them out of Egypt, delivering them from slavery. Last week, taking them down to Mount Sinai where the covenant is established, the law is given, and now leading them back up north so that they can take the land that had been promised to them. But throughout this journey in the wandering, you hear a lot of murmuring and grumbling. I like the two words, murmuring and grumbling. I guess they would... You'd call them kind of poetic. They kind of relate to the sound they're describing. For example, everyone just continued to say murmur, 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 murmur. Keep it up. Come on, louder. That's called murmuring. Now I want everybody to say grumble, grumble, grumble. There you go. Now you're grumbling. See? Uh, they murmured and they grumbled and they complained, even to the point where they said, we hate this food, this detestable manna, which we have to gather every day. Come on, we was better off when we went to Egypt. So they came to the Negev desert, and their um, spies went into the land. Joshua, Caleb, and other spies, they spied out the land. Joshua and Caleb came back and said, come on, guys, we can take them. But the other spies said, no, there's giants in the land. We'll never take the land. And they came back and they convinced the people that they should not enter in to that which God had provided. God had provided. They failed to enter in to that which God had provided. And God said, not one of you will see the promised land. This generation will die off in the wilderness and the next generation will enter in to that which has been provided and promised to them. Even Moses kind of blew his cool a little bit. Uh, they, they needed water. God said, speak to the rock, Moses. You'll get water out of it. Moses took his rod and bang, hit the rock. God said, hey, Moses, come on. You need more patience. I haven't wondered about that. I mean, pastoring two million people, how much patience can you have? What a, what a, what a, what a task that had to have been. But anyway, Moses died then on Mount Nebo. I was on Mount Nebo once. We looked for his burial place, but no one knows where it is. We weren't able to find it either. Moses died on Mount Nebo. But before Moses died, he gave the people the law again. The law had been given on Mount Sinai, and now this generation had died off, and Moses gave them the law again. In Greek, the words deutero means second, nomos means law. Put them together, and which book do you have? Deuteronomy. Very good. You know your Greek. Second law. And so the law was given again because this generation was not present at Mount Sinai. And now they're at the Jordan, ready to be led by Joshua and to take the land which the Lord had promised to them. We had been saying that the purpose of doing this story is to find Jesus, that we might grow in our relationship with our Lord Jesus. And there is one event that occurred in the wanderings which Jesus himself relates to what he would do on the cross. And of course, that is the event of the serpent. They grumbled against the Lord. They said they hated the food that he had given to them. And so God sent among them venomous snakes. 
And the people were bitten, then they died. And the people came to Moses, Moses, we've sinned against God. We've sinned against God. Go to God, pray, ask him what we should do. And the Lord God told Moses to make a bronze serpent, to put it up on a pole, and that when a person is bitten by the venomous serpent, they look up at the snake on a pole and they will live. Um, the, the, the logistics of this had to be very interesting. If you're looking at two million people here, he had to raise that, that snake pretty high so people might see it. Imagine he might have had to travel quite a distance after being bitten by a snake so that they could look upon the snake on a pole, the bronze serpent. And then Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. You notice the simplicity of it. Bitten by a snake, look at the bronze serpent. Fell into sin, look to the cross of Jesus Christ. Worried about the future, look to the cross of Jesus Christ. The, the simplicity of God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, we're all here a bunch of whosoevers. Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. What an incredible, simple message. The Apostle Paul in Corinthians says, I wish that, that your mind is not distracted, that you don't get filled up with so many other thoughts that you, that you fall away from the simplicity that is found in Christ Jesus. For a number of years, I, I did a radio program on KFUO called Issues, Etc. Talk about issues. This was back in the 80s. I was amazed at the number of things that are out there, the stuff that is out there, the movements, the ideas, the notions, the conflicts, the controversies. Everyone, this is right, this is wrong, we should do this, we shouldn't do that. And all these things coming down the highway oh, within the church, in Christianity, in the nation, in their, in their religiosity, thinking about the things of God and what we should do, what we shouldn't do, how we should do it, when we should do it, why we should do it, what's this about? And I thought, whoa, all the stuff that we get caught up in. And yet you have this simplicity of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I was kind of wondering, I wonder what would have happened in the wilderness if the mindset of this generation, of our generation, had been transferred to the people out there in the wilderness. How would they have responded when Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole and said, when you're bitten, look here and you'll be saved? Pretty simple, isn't it? Well, I'm sure the philosophers would have got together around a table and said, why are these bad things happening to these good people? The psychologists would have come to Moses and said, Moses, you got to correct the people. They said it was their sin that caused these venomous snakes. If that's the case, Moses, it's going to really affect their self-esteem. It's going to bruise their sensitive inner child. So Moses, you, you shouldn't let them believe that. Tell them it's just, you know, it's the breaks of the game. It has nothing to do with their sin. The postmodernists in the group came to Moses. You know, Moses, you're rather intolerant, telling me that the only way is through the snake on a pole. Come on, Moses. There's got to be other ways. This may be truth for you, but it's not necessarily truth for everybody. The mystics in the group felt they could adjust reality by their mental exercises, by their positive confessions. And a number of them put bumper stickers on their wagons which read, Visualize no snakes. <laughs> the feminists in the group were rather upset that Moses had not asked a woman to lift the serpent on a bowl. One woman was heard to say, I'm not going to look at any snake on a pole held up by a man. She died of snake bite, and they, but they had a candlelight vigil in her honor. The men said the real problem is we have abdicated our role as fathers and husbands. They formed a covenant keepers movement. They, they reasoned that no snake in his right mind would ever bite a man of integrity. And then you had the liberals, the liberals. 
They questioned whether Moses had really heard from God. They set up a seminar called the Moses Seminar where they voted on which words God had really told Moses. Some of them with a political kind of mindset felt that people were dying of snake bite because they didn't have sufficient health care. <laughs> the conservatives said, wait a minute, you know, we like this snake on a pole. It's a good idea, but we need to get back to the faith of our founding fathers. Back to the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Washington, Adams, and Madison, if you will. They said, back to the faith of the founding fathers, and we'll have freedom over snakes. And they put a snake and put an X through it. And of course, what were they called? The Fox Network. (laughs) The liberals, the conservatives. And then you had the religious leaders. They had all kinds of ideas regarding this snake on a pole. One group said, it's too easy. Come on, it's too easy. These people have sinned against God. They should at least do penance. You can't simply let them look at the snake on a pole and be saved. They should be doing their penance or go through some form of purgatory in order to get saved. Another group said, well... Yeah, we like the snake on a pole, but let's focus on the fact that this whole group went through the waters of the Red Sea and were delivered by this baptism into Moses. That's really central. Another group concluded that Moses was was making all of divine revelation about a snake on a pole. He should also be holding up the Ten Commandments in addition to the snake on a pole. One group looked at the entire assembly and couldn't figure out why one group looked And another group didn't look. Why are these people looking at this snake on a pole and these people are not? So they arrived at the conclusion that it all had to be be about predestination. God had chosen this group to look and God had chosen this group not to look. I could reverse it if you want. But a group said to them, "That's, that's terrible, that's ridiculous. It's not about God's predestination. It's about human free will. And he said, we got to do things to motivate the people to look at this snake on a pole. And so they, they had a singing group that went through the assembly singing, just as I am without one plea, but that the snake was raised for me. Then there was this weird group of religious leaders who emerged. They said, we need to find out what the people are really, really looking for. So they took a poll. One group wanted aerobics so they could get in better physical condition to run away from the snakes. Another group wanted to learn principles for living in a wilderness infected by venomous snakes. And a third group merely wanted to be made to feel good. There was this Pastor Joel and his blonde wife who set up a large tent and they had a huge assembly and everybody came out with a smile regardless of how many venomous snakes were around. Another group just sat in a corner and sang Kumbaya. (laughs) And God said, you know, you guys need more fiery serpents. And he increased the number of fiery serpents until every eye was willing to behold the snake on her pole. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that all who believe in him will have eternal life. The simplicity of it all. Here's Jesus. Here's the cross. But you know what the Apostle Paul is saying about the cross? It's foolishness to the Greeks. It's a stumbling block. It's offensive. The cross is offensive. Why is that true? Think about it. The shedding of the blood of Christ is there for the forgiveness of of your sins. It says you can't do it. If there's anything the cross does, it beats at our human pride. It tells us that we are unable to make it. Nobody is good enough. Good enough is not good enough. Nobody is able to make it. You need somebody to die for you. Wow. You need somebody to die for you so that you might be forgiven. It beats at our pride. It takes us out of the picture. It's not about us. It's about what Jesus has done. And then you have the intensity of the death of Christ. 
What does it say about the nature of our sin if it took the shedding of the blood of the sinless Son of God to pay the price? It says that we are not just little sinners. We need God's Son to pay the price for our sin. One time when I was doing radio, a lady called me up and she said, when I think that if I was the only sinner in the world, that Jesus would have died for me. I feel so good about myself. I said, lady, if you're telling me that your sin without the rest of us contributing our share was sufficient for the sinless Son of God to shed his blood on the cross, how in the world does that make you feel good about yourself? It took the shed blood of the sinless Son of God to be the price for your forgiveness. Wow. The cross also evens everything out. See, we, we, in our natural way of thinking, we, we think of good sinners, bad sinners. You know what I mean? There's real bad sinners out there. I'm going to go with Stalin and Hitler. And, and I almost said, no. I, I, was, I almost said Obama. That was... No, you know, you know the guy who, uh, we better keep moving. Yeah, okay, get myself in more trouble here. Uh, we think that there's some sinners who are really bad. You know, they, they do it up well. And there are other sinners, well, they're kind of mediocre sinners. We're, sometimes we think of ourselves as maybe the C plus or B minus sinners as opposed to the F sinners. The cross levels it all out. I don't care if you're Jeffrey Dahmer or your mother Teresa. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It's the great leveler. All have sinned and come short of God's glory. You have been forgiven of all your sins. You've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Luther said, purchased and won from all sin, from death and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been reconciled with the Father. Once you were enemies and now you and God are friends again. You belong to the Father in heaven. You have been made right with God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which has been placed upon you. You are righteous in the eyes of God. You have been given the Holy Spirit and motivated to live in love and joy and peace. And you get all of that because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And all of the benefit that is in the cross of Jesus Christ is delivered to a baby in baptism. Delivered through the preaching of the gospel. I love that verse where Paul says, and God has chosen, get this, God has chosen to save the world by the foolishness of what we preach. Imagine that. God has chosen to save the world by the foolishness of what we preach. The cross of Jesus Christ. As we gather around the Lord's table, all the benefit of the cross is delivered. And as Pastor Schlee stands up with confession and forgiveness, he offers it, and the benefit is again delivered to you. And all of that comes to you in the cross of Jesus Christ. Nothing comes to you without the cross. That's why it is such an abomination when churches marginalize the cross of Jesus Christ. It is such an abomination when you sit in a pew and you listen to some guy preach and he never mentions Jesus. Lightning should hit that pulpit. It's such an abomination when we as Christians fill our hearts and minds with so many other things rather than focusing upon the one thing needful, what God has done for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. The promises are in the cross, in the cross of Christ I glory. So as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And you could take that to the bank. Can I hear an amen out of you?
And may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and keep your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.